Dumont. We continue with our number two of Beyond the Beltway. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. 1-800-723-8289. Uh, that's the phone number. Uh, before we go too much further, I just want to uh, just uh, take a moment to talk about uh, two significant people who passed away this week. Uh, uh, I never met Hank Aaron, but I saw him play baseball on many occasions at Wrigley Field in Chicago. Uh, he, he was, I think he was probably the greatest hitter that I ever saw. The ease with which uh, he swung that bat and hit uh, home runs and, and also was a great outfielder. And again, his contributions as being one of the uh, the biggest, one of the biggest baseball stars in my life. Uh, again, uh, you know, when someone of that stature passes away, it's, it, it kind of hits you a little bit and you, you, you think about where you were and the significant role that he played not only in society, but uh, you know, it was part of your own life. And then uh, uh, the other thing that is maybe much more closer to me uh, was the passing of Larry King at age uh, 87. Uh, Larry was a personal friend uh, as well as a career, uh, just someone that I admired greatly, uh, who turned his uh, radio show into a, uh, into a very popular television show. Uh, we became good friends in the development of the Museum of Broadcast Communications. He did uh, many favors for us. And uh, was really a terrific guy. He, he loved baseball. Uh, he, he was down to earth. There were no heirs except the one thing. You know, one of the things because he, he started and overcame uh, some serious fiscal problems. In his clo- closing years of his life, he liked to travel in a private jet. And he had many friends who had private jets. And uh, whenever I asked him to do something, which involved usually coming to Chicago, uh, he would not send me a bill for it, but he'd get one of his friends to uh pick him up and pick his uh, many friends up as well. And, uh, you know, five or six people who were friends of Larry, we'd all go to a ball game. And so uh, that's the type of guy that Larry King was. And, again, just the tremendous contribution of of the programs that he created on radio. Uh, He was really the sort of the father of late-night radio and bringing in-depth interviews. And then, of course, the tremendous success he had uh, with CNN over the years, interviewing just about everyone. I mean, yeah, you weren't anybody in the world if you had not been interviewed by Larry King. And again, uh, he was quite a, uh, quite a, quite a guy. Uh, anyway, joining us now for the uh, second part of our, our program, let me welcome Nick Com. Nick Com is uh, uh, from Chicago, and he is with Reputation Partners, and he is a Republican. And also with us uh, this evening, we have Derek Addis, who is a Democrat, uh, and he is a digital marketing expert. And then we have Spike Cohen who uh, last year was the uh, Libertarian Party candidate for vice president of the United States, and uh, he joins us as well. Uh, Gentlemen, I want to begin, and Spike, I want to begin with you because uh, uh, there's been discussion that uh, Donald Trump uh, may be thinking about starting a new party, and I'm wondering, uh, given uh, where the body politic is at the moment, where do you put the Libertarian Party as a serious, viable alternative to people out there who feel that uh, uh, the answers to our society uh, will not be found uh, in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Well, Bruce, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on your show. And I'd also like to, and and this is kind of in keeping with your question, I'd like to address uh, a very blatantly false assertion that was made by one of your previous guests in the in the first hour, okay. uh, where she claimed that we worked with the Madigan campaign to illegally get on the ballot. The fact of the matter is Mike Madigan agrees with her and the Republican Party and actually fought us in court to keep us off the ballots. And thankfully, the court sided with us and the Illinois state constitution and allowed us on the ballot. And in fact, Jeannie should know uh, that uh, Mike Madigan was fighting against us because she was in that same court trying to keep her libertarian opponent off the ballot. So she knew full well that uh, not only were we not working with Mike Madigan, Mm -hmm. but Madigan was actually working with the Republicans doing what Republicans and Democrats Mm -hmm. always do, which is to keep every other viable option off the ballot if they are able to. Thankfully, again, the court sided with the constitution and with the libertarian party and kept us on the ballot. Uh, With your question, uh, if Donald Trump uh, does choose to uh, form a new political party, they're going to discover what every other non-Republicrat discovers when they try to be on the ballot. If you're a Republican or Democrat candidate, you have basically universal and 
automatic access to the ballot. If you are anyone else, you have to collect in some states, including uh, Illinois, tens or even hundreds of thousands of signatures and spend thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, in some cases per candidate, to even get on the ballot in the first place. That's one of the many barriers and burdens that the Republicans have put in place to keep everyone else off. And they are effectively robbing the American people of having any other option besides them and the and the crony gravy train that they've set up to keep themselves in power and nice and uh, nice and fat and healthy in uh, in D.C. and and as well as in Springfield. If, and um, so if he does decide to start a new party, he's going to he's going to have a fun time finding out what ballot access looks like. Spike, if if uh, Donald Trump or his uh, uh, associates came to you and, and said, we, we'd like to we'd like to switch over to the Libertarian Party. Would the leaders and the movers and shakers within the Libertarian Party, the official Libertarian Party, would they welcome that or would they uh, just run away cringing? We welcome anyone who wants to become a libertarian. We'd also like them to understand that the Libertarian Party uh, is not just a party that, and this may be something they're not used to, we're not just a party that is worried about getting on the ballot and, and worried about you know getting in elected into positions of power so that we can you know give favors back to the people who put us in, in who helped pay for our campaigns. The purpose of the Libertarian Party is we believe that the American people do best when they are most free. We see the mess that Republicans have put us in, and we recognize that the reason that we are in that mess isn't just because these specific candidates are the problem or these politicians are the problem. They've set up a system whereby they try to control our lives and tell us how to live and rob us to pay for it. That system is a blatant and proven failure. doesn't matter which side is in office. You get the same thing, more debt, more taxes, more control of your life, a, a cost of living continuing to spiral out of control, uh, more people put in cages for victimless crimes, and just generally the average everyday American family finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. Nick uh, Com, the Libertarian want, Party recognizes that it, that will only end when we get these people out. I want to go to uh, Nick Com, who's a conservative. Uh, I think he's probably more of a conservative than a Republican, but uh, he runs a company called Reputation Partners. Uh, Nick, and you've spent much of the last year and a half or two or three years uh, defending Donald Trump on this program, uh, but also criticizing him when you thought that he was wrong. Um, does Donald Trump deserve another shot at the White House? Well, I think that's up for the voters and the party. No, but they're, they're not here. I'm asking you. If they were all here, I'd ask them all, or they can call in. I, well, I, let me try think? to answer your question. This, let me try to answer your question this way, Bruce. I don't think he's done or said anything that would disqualify him from holding okay. office again. Right. I think, But I think the bigger issue, Bruce, and it's interesting to listen to uh, my fellow panelist uh, Spike here, because that's a, that is seems like a classic definition of libertarianism versus Eric Cohn, who's I think just more of an anti-Trumper who was on in the previous hour. Yeah. It's just interesting to contrast that. Mm -hmm. But I think the point here is that um, Donald Trump can be, and again, what's amazing to me, with, and I know you talked about the, the impeachment a bit in the first hour. Yeah. You know, if they impeach him, they're going to make him even more of a martyr. They're going to make him even more of a uh, of a kingmaker, if you will, and may, and indeed to your question, he may decide to run again. I personally don't think he's going to decide to run again. I think uh, there's no way to describe the last four years as anything remotely pleasant for him and what he gave up in order to lead the country. But thank you for noticing also that I was not always just a universal cheerleader for him, but I think he did a lot of good. Right. We're going to pause and we're going to hear from Derek Addis. When we come back, 1-800-723-8029, from coast to coast and border to border, from Evanston, Illinois, I'm Bruce Dumont. Bruce Dumont back uh, for Beyond the Beltway. We continue with uh, another segment on our second hour. Nice to have you with us. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, this second by welcoming uh, Derek Addis, who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Uh, Derek, you've not been a big fan of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, do you want him? Uh, do you want him tried and convicted and sent to prison? Uh, well, I think he has a right to like fair trial, like everyone else. Yeah, that's um, I good. think what I, whatever I personally believe about him is not for me the way that I would divulge how I feel the process should play out for him. Um, as far as the impeachment is concerned, I do think that that person has proven that they're no longer uh, can be trusted with holding office in that manner with what happened at the Capitol uh, two weeks ago. 
So you think there was a direct correlation between what Donald Trump said and the reaction of uh, the the demonstrators and the insurgents? Well, I mean, half of the people were wearing Trump garb. You know, they weren't out there of their own volition in the sense that they didn't just come up with it on their own. They were, you know, in essence, as someone who has been deployed in defense of our nation uh, to, to fight for something, um, I didn't see people that were fighting for democracy storming the Capitol. I saw people that were fighting for a person, uh, Donald Trump. Now, some people might suggest that uh, that was just a test. And there had been those that suggested that there was going to be a second confrontation, uh, you know, last week at the inauguration. Uh, that did not happen. So my question to you is, did the did the situation insofar as the insurrection did it did it reduce and lessen the, uh, the the power and the fear that that rings in the hearts of some people that think that these were hooligans that uh, need to be arrested and shut up forever? Well, I, I don't. What I do know is that a hundred people have been um, you know arrested for the crimes that they committed right. uh, at the Capitol that day, uh, and I think uh, in terms of the the additional you know um, pro- protests is what they would want to call it. Um, on inauguration day, I think that those were quelled around the city, uh, around the states, because they saw there was repercussions for the actions that that the the many took, uh, you know, two weeks prior. Yeah. So I think that's really what put it wasn't damper much on their, of a turnout. Initial plan. There, there really wasn't much of a turnout for for all the hype about that there was going to be uh, mm-hmm. outbreaks and, and demonstrations in 50 state capitals. Uh, that didn't really happen to any great significance. Yeah, no, not at all. Like I said, I think that you know. Uh, everybody wants to do something until someone else does it, and then they get, you know, in trouble for it, and then all of a sudden nobody wants to be a part of this thing anymore. So that what that I think is a defining thing between actual movements, like progressive real movements where people are willing to put their bodies on the line and be hurt for something to progress humanity, and then people who just want to get their president, you know, uh, the election overturned, you know, stop the steal. Like, that That wasn't a movement. That, they just bum-rushed the Capitol, uh, and I think it was incredibly misguided. Uh, Nick, uh, my question to you is, uh, how badly has this hurt the, uh, the, the the future of the Republican Party to, uh, at the conclusion of the Trump administration, to try to put the party back together, either with Donald Trump or a tapped-down Donald Trump? And uh, uh, how likely is it that those Republicans who joined in voting for uh, Joe Biden, how likely is it that they will ever come back if Donald Trump is anywhere near that party? Yeah, well, I think it does, to answer your question, Bruce, I think it has hurt, at least in the near term, the Republican Party, because it basically played into the worst fears that folks like Derek and others on the left have about people who are conservative or Republicans. It's like, oh, my God, they would rush the Capitol. They would try to overturn the election. And I know that there was at least some element of this that was uh, certainly encouraged by uh, Donald Trump. But I don't think I don't and and it has silenced Republicans as well. Right now, they are quietly sitting by while Joe Biden is signing more executive orders than any of his predecessors by like an order of magnitude. And Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are getting ready to try to ram through things like the questionable election tactics that put us where we are in the first place and cause Donald Trump to be so upset about the uh, election results. Do you believe that every Republican who voted for uh, the impeachment in the House uh, and every Republican who might vote to convict the president, are they taking their political, uh, is that a political suicide mission for them? Or do you think that they will be viewed as a profile in courage and it will help their political careers? The only thing it's going to help the, you know, the, the Mitt Romney's and the uh, Adam Kinzinger's and others who are still going out and bashing Trump and even Mitch McConnell to some degree, they're turning off people who have been passionately in support of the president uh, again. And whether he's now on the sidelines temporarily or permanently, I think they're doing themselves a tremendous disservice. What the party needs to do is figure out how to capture that, um, uh, that flame in a bottle, if you will, which is disaffected, working class people, classic conservatives, mainline Republicans, and even people who are, again, don't laugh when I say this, conservative Democrats, I'm sure there's one or two of them out there, and even libertarians and others who are not affiliated with any party, 
who saw what the president did in terms of economic growth, in terms of um, actually putting policies in place that brought manufacturing jobs back to the United States, if a Republican, and I don't know whether it'll be Nikki Haley or Marco Rubio or somebody else, it's not going to be one of the Republicans, Bruce, who's out there now bashing uh, Donald Trump and piling on with the Democrats. The only thing that they're doing is they're ensuring that when they get voted out of office or primaried out of office, they're going to have a nice home for themselves on MSNBC or CNN. But it's also well, not going to be any of the people who supported this agenda because we just saw $7 trillion in debt being run up under a supposed conservative government. We saw uh, a, a continuation and an expanding of a trade war that lost led to a decimation of farming communities in the U.S. that they then had to be bailed out with taxpayer money because they would have otherwise yeah. they would have starved to death because they were losing everything. We saw a massive ramping up of the so-called wars that he was going to end overseas and instead he ramped them up, including the U.S.-sponsored Gen genocide that's going on in Yemen under the direction of the Saudi talking, government and al-Qaeda. This is he, what happens. You're certainly president. not going to get any libertarians okay, on board on this, Fife. much he's less any only, conservative once, Republicans. Once, once again, folks, uh, uh, he's go the ahead. only president who has not put us into a war and, in fact, has drawn down troops so well, okay, he power. has not drawn he down troops. There was a criticism. net increase of troops under Donald Trump. He did a surge and then brought it's, some of them back. I know that after it, years of it, Republican it, yeah. and Democrat rule, when we see a decrease after a massive increase, we pretend that that's a decrease. But the net number of troops that are overseas right now is higher than when Donald Trump came into office. Derek Caddis, so, do you want to uh, yeah, jump in here? Yeah, so. Yeah, I do. So it's, we're talking about parties, right? And the Republicans, because that's yeah. Trump's party now, right? And so uh, to uh, something for you, Bruce, you you uh, you com you confuse me with a Democrat quite often, and I notice the uh, lower thirds has me as a progressive Democrat. But I've alluded to many times of my independent affiliation, if that oxymoron actually makes sense. And one of well, the well, things but that let I me, think let me did just, come let out me, of this. Let me let me do this because I want to be correct, and I our director will be listening, and we'll we'll erase that lower third. I mean. How would you describe Appreciate yourself? It. You're not really an independent, I'm an independent are you? Right? I, I, I'm an independent. I, I grew up in Texas surrounded by yeah. a bunch of conservatives, a bunch of the Hispanic conservatives who were voting for Trump. There's people in my family who are Trump voters. Okay. And I listen to them. And there's there are some things that they believe in that I also believe in. So when we talk about- Was there about, anything that Donald Trump said that you liked? Was there anything well, here, that yeah, Donald he did. Trump you know said? What? You know what he did? What? I, I would love for him to create another party. I want him to do that. I want him okay. because I want both sides. Hold on. I want both sides. I want the Democratic Party to cannibalize itself, and I want the Republican Party to cannibalize itself as well because we need a multi-party system in, this, in, in these states. The reason why yes. uh, everyone now is talking about the deficit and troops in other countries and all this stuff, there is a gridlock in our Congress because it is owned by big business, and it is owned by big money interests. And I think yep. the only way to break that stronghold is to break up all these parties, you know, because Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, they eat together and they have these nice dinners and they are friends. Whether they come yep. out in front of the media and tell us that they're not, they are. Right. So I'm not so I, sure I want that. Donald Trump <laughs> to create a party. For sure. That's so much not I don't that's not going to. First of all, that would be incredibly stupid of Trump. to. And I know he's talking about it and floating. Why? of creating a patriot he owns party. The party, it is absolutely dumb. This is where I give it, and again, if you're not a Democrat, okay, you're, I see now you're an independent you. according to the, to the crawl there. But again, the Democrats, I hand it to them because they have incredible party discipline. You know, AOC is over here doing her little thing and the gang of mm -hmm. four, whatever, they're doing their little thing, but yeah. the Democrats are able to enforce party discipline like nobody's business. What we were just talking about where Republicans are going out, well, I think I'm gonna vote, to impeach Donald Trump, he's out of office. Let him go. He's he's a character now that Democrats want and need as a boogeyman because otherwise none of the Republicans are stepping up. Democrats Spike, need a boogeyman. He's their boogeyman. Spike, when, Spike, when when Derek was talking about his future, uh, he skipped right over the Libertarian Party. How come? That's fine because the are thing they is, not here's taken the thing. seriously. We, we, when these parties begin to cannibalize, anyone who wants to see actual change, anyone who wants to see a smaller government that fits within its constitutional limitations, anyone who wants to see real criminal justice reform, there's only one party that is seriously proposing that, and that's the Libertarian Party. I want to go to what, what Nick said. He talks about the party discipline of the Democratic Party. What has that done for anyone other than the big politicians in the Democratic Party and their big business billionaire cronies? Joe Biden is the architect of every bad policy that progressive 
progressives hate. And yet they yeah. voted for him because they felt like they had no yeah. other viable option. The absolute best thing that could happen in this country is for the American people to have an entire slate of choices to choose from. Instead of being yeah. told you have red MAGA and blue MAGA yeah. and you blue have MAGA. to choose blue from MAGA. them, blue yeah. MAGA, you have to choose, you have many choices to choose from instead of being robbed of their choices and being stuck with the constant thievery that is happening right now. We have a system the, the whereby problem, trillions yeah. of dollars are run up in the names of people that aren't even born yet. If that isn't taxation without representation, I don't know what is. Yeah, and, and the problem now is they don't work for us. Politicians, exactly. they know, right? They know that they're like a shoe in for this district or whatever. They don't even have to try hard to get our votes anymore, yep. right? And, and that's, to me, again, I think that is the biggest problem. And, and so it, this is something that, okay, I live streamed the, the protests in Chicago all summer long. I was down on the ground. Derek, wait one camera, second. Derek, Derek I, wa- I want you to follow up on that, but we, we're going to a break yeah. right now. And then we, when we come back, I want you to finish your story, okay? I'm Bruce Dumont, back shortly. back from beyond the beltway and we are in evanston illinois nice to have you with us uh and uh we do appreciate uh, you're joining us each and every sunday night and whether you are listening to us on the radio watching us on youtube watching us on uh, on uh, facebook uh it's good to know where you're listening and where you're engaging this program and some people are just doing it on the old-fashioned computer and it's good to know where you're calling from and where you're participating so uh, uh, i know sometimes we have uh, we don't, we don't seem to have as many callers as we have in the past, but we have a lot more people who are engaged with uh, uh, Facebook uh, posts or uh, comments uh, on, uh, you know, on beyondthebeltway.com. Uh, but anyway, it's nice to have you with us. Uh, just, uh, we're going to take a moment here and let our guests introduce themselves for a moment and give us the, give us the short version, if you will. We're going to start with Derek Addis. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Derek Addis. Uh, I founded Balomathy Digital Media Marketing. I'm an Iraq War veteran. I'm a DePaul MBA, uh, and I'm just trying to bring everyone together. You are. Have you introduced yourself to Joe Biden? You may have a job. <laughs> I uh, have. That's not only once. Yet, but I would love. I would love to talk to Joe Biden. I have a lot of very, very interesting things for him to hear about. Well, I believe it. Well, he's got to watch. Yeah. Your, he's got to watch your podcast, right? We'll, yeah. t- we'll tell people where to I'll find them. I'll send them a you. link. All right. But you, uh, uh, yes. We're, we're, we're going to come back. I want to yeah. hear our other guests, and then I'm going to let you follow up with your story. Uh, Spike Cohen, tell us a little bit about you. Who uh, You were the uh, libertarian candidate for vice president of the United States. Uh, yeah. But tell us more. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Spike Cohen. Uh, I have been a business owner for over 22 years. Uh, I was the Libertarian Party's vice presidential candidate in last year's election. We came in third. And uh, we, uh, I also am the co-owner of Muddy Waters Media, the co-host of the Muddy Waters of Freedom, and the host of My Fellow Americans. Okay, and Nick Calm. I'll round it out then. I'm the third business owner. I own a strategic communications firm in Chicago called Reputation Partners. I've been politically active for many, many years, and uh, always a pleasure to be back here on your show, Bruce. Since you're all business people, let me ask this question, uh, and then I'm going to go to Air Derek to finish his story. Uh, $15 an hour. What will that do to uh, business in America, in your view, uh, Nick Com? Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe I'll surprise you a little bit with this response. I mean, it used to be, and I think it's a little bit of a canard to suggest that minimum wage jobs, so to speak, are really just part-time jobs for kids. But there is a large underclass, working class that is just struggling to get by. And I think it's been too long since they've increased the minimum wage. However, when they do, when or if they do bring it to $15 an hour nationally, that's going to create some havoc in some of the lower cost parts of the country, and it's going to drive wages up overall, and I think it's going to cut into profits. But having said that, I think there's actually some pretty strong reasons for doing it just to lift up the working class whose plight we really saw over this last year in a way that we have not seen before. And it, it's at, what, $7.25 now? Something like that. I yep. mean that that would be a yeah, tremendous that would be a that would be a tremendous uh, <laughs> upgrade from uh, yep. where it is. To right, but if you're getting going. a minimum wage in New York City or Chicago or Washington D.C., it's a very different thing than if you're getting mm-hmm. a fifteen dollar minimum wage in Pocatello, Idaho, for example. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Spike Cohen, what's your reaction to this? Yeah, so the reason that big businesses are pushing for minimum wage increases is because they can afford them and their smaller competitors can't. So especially in light of the last year of small businesses being absolutely decimated by these failed lockdowns, to then now hit them with, in some cases, near double, actually over doubling of their labor costs, um, it will drive more businesses out of business and it will lead to more unemployment. The real problem here is that the cost of living has been spiraling out of control because of bad monetary policy that has led to increasing inflation under both Republican and Democrat governments. The real answer is to return to sound monetary policy that will stop the inflationary uh, aspect and allow the increase of wages to meet with the cost of living. Uh, but this would actually make things worse. It would drive up costs. It would put smaller businesses out of business, which will give some fewer competitors to big businesses, and then will allow them to charge a lot more than they're charging now because they have fewer competitors. That drives up costs, it puts people out of business, and it destroys small business, which is the engine that keeps America running. Derek, what's your reaction? How would this affect you personally? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a small business, right? Uh, I definitely would be really hurt uh, having to pay. I work with another individual, uh, and I. But what's the what's the, what's the, what's the what's the limitation of number of employees? It isn't. So, it, you have to have a base number of employees to be uh, covered. Do you know? Right. So what I was what I was going to say is is and someone smarter in the room can can answer this. Is there's no way that there can be like a limit? Like if your company makes X amount per year, then you have to pay fifteen dollars. If you make less than right for so we can protect small businesses. If you make right. less than X, you know, per year, you're you're not subjected to that, right? I, I would like something like that. Let's is that go to, possible with a federal law? Let's go to Susan. I'm sure they could make it that way. Yeah. Let's I'm let's sure go to Susan. Right? Like, like why, I want I want I want to bring yeah, a like, guest. I want I want I want to bring a guest uh, in who maybe could comment on that and also uh, offer an opinion on Donald Trump. Susan, uh, whereabouts in Georgia are you from? Um, over towards the Atlanta area. Okay. Very good. Go ahead with your comment. Yeah, well, one just the first comment to mention Donald Trump. I don't think he should be allowed uh, to run back in office again. I don't know if the Senate could do a separate vote to not allow him to run in 2024. But he he truly doesn't have the character of the judgment, or does he have the decorum, personally or politically, to run? For the uh, to represent the United States of America and a free uh, free leader of the um, of the excuse me a leader of the free world, he is as a troublemaker. Um, when you get into that type of political arena, you need to represent um, your country as a person of true character, integrity. He has none of the above uh, characteristics as well. Um, Dr. Michael Savage, who is a friend of uh, Donald Trump, said he is not a conservative. He's a middle of the road. And he said, of course, we know he used to be a diplomat. And he's, uh, he's to some degree, he's hiding behind a lot of his uh, um, uh, insecurities and, and uh, deceptions. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, everybody talks about him uh, moving the capital to Jerusalem and doing all these wonderful things. Well, a lot of his uh, incentive was to promote the, the feathersation of Zionism. Donald Trump is a big Zionist, as well, friends with Netanyahu. And I've heard from several people. I've listened to talk shows. They said Donald Trump is part of the Chabad organization, along with Netanyahu. I don't know if you're familiar with the Chabad organization, but it's a criminal network in North America and as well Russia, China, and it's um, he's part of this organization. They Susan, they run money view, laundering, Susan, money laundering, Susan. sex, sex. Uh, t excuse me, go ahead, Susan. In in in, in, in your Alan Krzyzewski on ABC. In your in your view, in your view, how do you feel about the 75 million people who voted for Donald Trump, and they they totally disagree. With you, I mean. Uh, uh, well, they don't have the background on Donald Trump, sir. They go with what they see as because most of them aren't educated. Many of them are not educated. They don't do research. They know nothing about who Donald Trump really is, and they don't realize he he only took the Christian base. He took that base and used them to his uh, to to get into office. He told them that he was a Christian. Donald Trump doesn't have characteristics of a Christian. As a matter of fact, and if anyone would like to pull this up, I've heard from several sources 
These are reliable sources. One used to be a CIA agent, and he followed the political arena in Washington. Donald Trump quietly converted to Judaism back in 2017 <laughs> after he got into office. Okay. After he got into office. Okay. So he was Susan, appeasing and Susan, appealing to his Christian base to Susan, get into office. Then he changed to Judaism because of his Susan, daughter. It's on the internet. Susan, Susan, <laughs> just because. Oh, listen, listen, Susan, anybody, anybody Susan, can. Susan, Susan, Susan the Jews just, are just coming. Down. Just the Jews because are coming. it's on the internet doesn't make it true. I thank you very much for your call, but we've had enough you, of your yeah. comments. Thank you very it much. It depends. Yeah, Do you? Thank you. Thank you. Then, yeah. The next time that I have one at a time, who's talking? The next time that we, the next time that we have our big Jewish cabal meeting, I will be certain to give Susan's regards to President Trump. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I want to ask Spike a question based on an earlier discussion about. um, And I, first of all, I agree with the libertarian position about excessive debt and government spending. I absolutely do. But I'm curious, and again, maybe I could find this if I went to the Libertarian Party website, but what should right. government have done last year when our $22 trillion economy was shut down overnight? What should they, they have shouldn't, done? Uh, what they should have done was the FDA shouldn't have stopped healthcare workers for testing people for COVID for the first two months of the outbreak. That's what allowed it to spiral out of control in this country. And that's what led to the fear and 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 everything that led to the lockdowns. We now know that the lockdowns have completely failed. Uh, There is no correlation between lockdowns and a reduction in the spread of the virus long term. You can slow it down for about a week or two. uh, But the reality is you can't make everyone stay home for longer than a a few days. But you you Uh, correctly talked about businesses that were hurt. I'm just wondering what, what should government have done to help the businesses that were hurt, whether or not somebody agrees with your point about lockdowns and so forth, which I actually do. But what right. should government have done? And I agree, it's very problematic that the amount of government spending that has occurred now has skyrocketed. But what should government have done once they went down the path of lockdowns? What should they have done to support the businesses that were then going to fail and the tens of millions of people who thankfully temporarily yeah. were out That's of That's the easy answer. I'll, I'll let Spike go. That's the easy answer. Yeah. So according to the uh, Constitution, when the when the government uh, actually seizes a business, and let's be clear, the lockdown is a seizing of a business being able to operate, which is effectively a seizing of a business. They owe them compensation for it. So the reality is, yes, if, exactly. if they are if they are not yep. allowing people to work, then they should be giving those businesses, those small businesses and those yep. and those workers the money, especially when they're letting the big businesses stay open. They told us we couldn't go to a small shop, but we should go to Target or Costco. That's what happened, and that's how... No, that's not what happened. No, that's not what happened. Gentlemen, 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 when we come back, uh, the chair is going to go to uh, Derek Addis, but we've got a break. I'm Bruce Dumont. Thanks for joining us tonight. One more segment coming up. Derek, you were going to make a point during the break. Uh, yeah, I um, so I wanted to talk about uh, the real what I feel is like the real enemy of the people, right? And so we were talking earlier about breaking up the parties and all this stuff, you know. And I think there's a lot of similarities between the populism of a Bernie Sanders uh, a, a election run and a Trump, you know, presidential win, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I was saying was all summer long, I live streamed the protests in Chicago, right? So I saw mm-hmm. everything I, in my own eyes, right? What I saw of the Capitol. You know, everybody was trying to make these equivalencies between yep. the looting of the Gucci store in Chicago and people storming the Capitol, right? And what I saw was two very different groups of people with the same exact problem. And that yep. goes to our elected officials, right? It's the oligarchy, right? It's the big money. It's like like uh, he was saying, you know, Amazon was able to operate during the shutdowns, but small businesses were not, right? Yep. Amazon was able to have – and, and I'll, full disclosure – I use Amazon, right? I can walk and chew gum, right? I can try to make the things that I like better, you know? And I think that's what we all should do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I just wanted to draw a parallel between my reasoning for wanting to break up the parties because I think that when we break up the parties, we'll actually bring everyone together. You know what I mean? Because I think we'll actually be seeing a little bit clearly then. And then to touch really quickly about the money for the COVID relief, they gave money via the PPP program to people. But let's be real. I, I was a recipient of that money back like in April or March, right? Yes. It, I luckily was able to build my business during the pandemic, but you know how many people were not, right, who are have lost everything? Yeah. They passed the 
uh, trillion dollar defense budget, no problem. They couldn't even get people six hundred dollar yep. checks, even right now. You know what I mean? They're like, mm-hmm. oh, it's not two thousand anymore. Biden just got elected. He lied to people, said it's two thousand. Now they're only going to send you uh, six, uh, fourteen hundred. Maybe we might get, but some people got six hundred. The short answer to what we should have done for businesses and Americans during the during this time right now, give them money. We spend money on everything else. We spend money to kill people all around the world all the time. Give Americans money. It's our money, first of all. And I'm, that might be a little thing, with right? That? It's our money we, already we in the first given place. Money. We should have given money. Back. More money. Spike? Well, here, here's, in, here's my take on this, because that $1,400 of the proposed bill, it makes up less than a quarter of the money being spent. Guess where the other three quarters going? If you guess the big business uh, cronies that put Republicans and Democrats in office, you guess correctly, unfortunately. And that's true of the last Nailed two it. stimulus bills yeah. before it. It goes to big business and to big government, particularly particularly law enforcement agencies, to enforce these lockdowns. And like every other uh, 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 thing that is handed to law enforcement, these things are disproportionately used against marginalized communities. Uh, I thought I didn't see you wearing a mask has become the new I thought I smelled weed. And guess who that gets used against? Okay. This is why, as Derek was saying, we need to break up the parties. Joe Biden Biden would have no sooner ever been elected the next president if Americans had had a, a variety of choices to choose from. Yes. But they were told you've got blue MAGA or red MAGA. You got to choose from, uh, you know, uh, mean tweeting imperialist tyrant or not mean tweeting imperialist tyrant. And so they chose the one who was nice on Twitter. And that's what it came down to. All right. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely by design. Like they, they had they had us turning on each other. Right. So I, as a Bernie Sanders off. supporter, yep. was shunned. By the Democrats for, for, for it's not your time. Stop asking for health care right now. Stop yeah. asking for a minimum wage for people. It's not well, that's your the, time. But that's like, the political process, when? Derek. That's the political process. Well, I mean, there there's right. there's Joe Biden Democrats and there's Bernie Sanders Democrats. And they battled. Right. And, that, and in this battle, the Joe Biden Democrats won. But imagine if instead the Bernie Sanders people and the Joe Biden people, the progressives and the establishment people, and for that matter, the populists and conservatives and yes. establishment yeah. people in the Republican Party could choose their own choices and we could choose that way. What do you want to bet that in a choice between Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, and say Joe Jorgensen with the Libertarian Party, and then maybe a constitutionalist, yeah. neither Trump nor Biden would have won that election? Yeah. Nick, and I mean, are and you again, worried about that? Yeah, let's, let's, let's get Nick. Uh, look, I think this is one of those nice pipe dreams, unfortunately, in theory. You know, with all due respect, Spike, I mean, what did you guys get percentage-wise? You guys are, I, I, I actually support, let me, let me finish. I support a lot of yeah. the things that you're talking about, but essentially what you guys are, are spoilers. You spoil, you end up spoiling elections, and because we are such a divided country, and again, I would, yes, ideally it would be great to have more choices than just Democrats or Republicans. Absolutely. That's a, a very noble thing. But what you end up doing is you end up siphoning off just enough votes from either the Democrat so that the Republican wins or from the Republican so the Democrat wins. That's I mean, that's, it it's, Roger, it's nice but, to be noble. The vast majority, majority of our voters in exit polls say that they would vote for another folks, option. Folks, folks, no, not, folks, folks, Roger in Austin, Texas wants to rebut Nick. So, Roger, go ahead. Hello. Yes, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Roger, are you there? Hi. Go ahead. I'm here. Well, go. Hello. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, what I want to say. Anybody, I does anybody said, want to claim I, Roger is a member of their political party? No, no, no. The libertarians could use the votes. They need more spoilers. He might be a libertarian, okay. but we really don't know. So, again, so ahead. Nick, that, what you just said is exactly what I just said the Democrats did to me, right? Yep. We got to stop doing that to each other. You can't be sick just because someone exercises their right to vote for who they want to. You don't label them a, 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 a what did you say? A, um, spoiler. They take votes away. They're spoilers, it, right? And That's it's, what they it's, are, though, it's Derek. Fair. Okay, but it's worse than this. It's not a natural product of the American people's voting decisions that we have two parties. It's because starting in 1880 and moving forward for the next hundred years, Democrats and Republicans worked in process 
work together to create ballot access restrictions at the state and federal level yeah. that make it functionally impossible for third parties to run. They have not, they have robbed the American people of so, anything other than their thievery as a viable option. This is not that the voters only oh. want two choices. And the reason they're I divided is Spike. because of the good cop, bad cop routine Spike, that many, Republicans and Democrats were talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, on this, uh, the first official show of the Biden administration, we're talking about a th- third party already. And uh, yeah. we thank our guest, Spike Cohen. Thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Uh, activist with the Libertarian Party of the United States and uh, the 2020 vice presidential candidate, uh, along with uh, Joe Jorgensen, who we had as a guest on Beyond the Belt. Also, Derek Addis, nice to have you with us. Uh, next time we're going to get you, you're going independent. You don't want to be associated with the Democratic Party. And now we know that you're on, you're on the record. And Nick Com, you Thank want you. to be associated with the Republican Party because hopefully they pay their bills on time, right? <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> our, th- <laughs> thanks, our thanks to Connor McKnight and I'm Bruce Dumont. Good night.